Praise the Lord. How many has come to praise unto the Lord this evening? Praise the Lord. Let's just stand this time. If there are requests this evening, I know some that was asked this morning, and I'm sure that, that they're still on God's books right now, so praise the Lord. All right, let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee, we thank the Lord. We sense, Lord, thy presence here this evening. And, Lord, we have come here to sing the songs of Zion, Lord, and to praise thee and to worship thee. Lord, have your way in every part of this service, Lord, and we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory, for it belongs to thee. We ask this now in that precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this evening. song in the, in the blue book, uh, 109, down in the valley. <coughs> Savior found me way down in the valley of despair. Then I told him all my troubles, my joys, then he doubled. I'm back up on the mountain rejoicing in his care. I was down in the valley, way down in the valley, when the Savior heard my feeble cry now i'm back up on the mountain way up on the mountain drinking from the fountain that never will run dry if you don't watch old satan he'll get you in the valley hide you from the savior's guiding light stay behind you he will never find you way up on the mountain if you fight a good fight i was down in the valley way down in the valley when the savior heard my feeble cry now i'm back up on the mountain way up on the mountain drinking from the fountain that never will run dry if you don't watch old satan he'll get you in the valley hide you from the savior's guiding light but he will stay behind you he will never find you Way up on the mountain, if you fight a good fight. I was down in the valley, way down in the valley, when the Savior heard my feeble cry. Now I'm up on the mountain, way up on the mountain, drinking from the fountain that never Anyone have a number? One sixteen in the blue book. (laughs) 
I think it's G again. <laughs> Life is so easy when you're up on the mountain. You have peace of mind that you
else have a number? 173? Same book. 173. Mm. Maybe D. D. <coughs> I've had many tears and sorrows. Had questions for tomorrow. There are times I did not rise from the But in every situation, God is a consolation. And
Just a little longer and the trump of God will sound. Just a little longer and we'll all be glory bound. Look the way to Jesus, our redemption.
Up, up, up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the Precious three 
Dennis Ray and uh-huh. I uh, used to sing it to God together when we were first married in courting. <laughs> but I can't get him to sing it with me now. <laughs> Down this road I can see A bright light Shining On me It's far away But the pull is strong Someday This old road Won't be so long
drawing nigh, and the joy that is there before us, it is the joy that will make us fly. I long for a place that is free, free from all pain and misery, where every tear will be gone from our
Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to worship in the songs of Zion. But also wonderful to see what God has for us as He leads us along in through life's valley, life's journey. You know, Oh, it was frozen. Lord, as we look at thee this this evening, Lord, as we would look into your word, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, uh, Lord, help this vessel of clay to bring forth whatever you would have for us at this time. We're asking now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. You may see it. God usually works. He has certain numbers or certain pattern that he works with, and he don't change because he knows it works. Yeah. He finishes things in sevens, perfects things in threes, and so these are some of the numbers that God uses. And uh, when we look back in how this whole world ever started. Now bear with me, it's going to be getting some used to, but. Before man came on the earth, before you hit in Genesis chapter one, Verse 1, he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He doesn't tell man it's so many years. First of all, if you had been in Adam's day or even in Moses' day, it didn't count like we count years in, in time frame right now. I mean, the, you might have told them 10 years, 100 years or so, but when you're talking about billions of years, I don't think they would have understood and so, therefore, it was not necessary for Moses or Adam to know how long when God first created the heavens and the earth. And when he did create the heavens and the earth, it's 13, whether it's 13.5 or 13.8 billion years ago, it doesn't really matter. It's billions, it's pretty big. How many know that? But our planet is not... And our sun is not 13 billion years ago. It's only four and a half billion years ago that our sun came into being. So when God created this uh, universe by his laws, like we mentioned before, those are laws by which nature behaves, that he put into nature, and nothing can transgress those laws because they how they work. It's God that's behind it. But as he created the heavens and the earth, how that for the, in the prehistoric world before God placed Adam, there was four or five ice ages from the billions of years till from three billion of years till you came just before God would want to put Adam on the earth. And out of those ice ages, you have animals, you have primitive life forms. An ice age came along, kills that off. Then you had a larger creature. Another ice age comes, and it, it's dead. Then finally, there's the dinosaur, and then the prehistoric man. But when prehistoric man came, God put a halt to have Satan, that was supposed to be the ruler of the earth, because when Jesus said concerning uh, Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. That's not the beginning of man's beginning here. That's way back in his Garden of Eden. Now, 
Satan's Garden of Eden, it's not man's Garden of Eden. Man's Garden of Eden is trees. Oh, those are not real trees or plants, but anyway. So, when God calls it the Garden of Eden, it means a garden of beginnings. And so when Lucifer was created, he was created when the, amongst the stones that we find here on the earth, when the earth was being formed in the crust. And all those stones are in, if you want to, Satan or Lucifer's beginning. And as that's in, in his beginning, that points you back to four and a half billion years ago. That's where he started. And so he, he, God gave him in charge the whole angelic family to take care of everything, and that was fine. But then he brought evil. And God is merciful, because he could have banished Satan after that first ice age. But he gave a number of times, till it came where the prehistoric man, when that came to a close, now God judges Satan, and he was going to bring man on the scene, and when he was going to put man on the scene, then now God was going to give Adam the authority to rule the earth. It was given him to be the ruler of the earth in time as God would, would have him on the earth. But as Adam was tried, we know he fell. But in all of this, when, Ad, when we talk about the world, that the creative days, when you read from Genesis chapter 1, starting from verse 2, down till the time God creates man, in reality, there was, each one of those creative days were a thousand years of time. And all God was doing, he had moved the planet to put in a deep freeze prior to, to wanting to deal with man. As he puts it in a deep freeze, now he's moving the planet to go a little closer to the sun. And what do you get? The ice melts. Vapor, uh, water appears, vapor. Then they, you can see the stars and so forth. Plant life starts to grow. So God could have told Moses, hey, Moses, I'm just going to move the planet, and he's the cause and effect. Over 6,000 years of time, this is what's going to happen. But remember, Moses don't have the knowledge that we have today. So therefore, God uh, was restoring the planet. Each one of those creative days, if you want to, in Genesis. See, God said, I didn't make. He says, let it be. Let it happen. Let, let the planet warm up and melt the ice. Let the planet warm up and, and have water appear on the surface. Let it warm up and let this, the, the steam open the, that now you can see the, the stars and so forth. They always was there from a long time before Adam was placed on here, on the earth. But what we see when God placed Adam on the earth, before he placed him, he was created in the spirit world. How wonderful that would have been. He was there on the sixth creative day. Adam was there for over a thousand years in the spirit world before God ever puts him on the earth. Because God rested on the seventh day, and he only put man on the first day of the week or the eighth day concerning the account of Genesis. It's not really where I want to go here this evening and just looking at certain things. In, when man fell, God works in threes. He brought a flood, the flood of Noah. He baptized it in water. 2,000 years, uh, 4,000 years later, he brings his only begotten son, and he shed his blood to redeem the earth and everything that's contained therein in man. And I had heard something that was kind of interesting. Satan, when Satan came to tempt Jesus, when he was out in the wilderness, he says, I'll show you and have, give you all these kingdoms. But Jesus had not shed his blood yet. And so there's no way that Satan could have gave him that kingdom 
Because God required it to be purchased by blood to begin with. So Satan was just tempting Jesus, saying, I can give you all these things. But knowing what he knew, that it, the earth had to be redeemed and be purchased, purchased for sinful mankind and also to redeem the earth, there had to be a blood sacrifice. The third thing that takes place, God's going to baptize this world in fire. That's the judgment that's coming up the road after the bride leaves, after the week of Daniel is over. So there's three types that God moves in, in three different types. Now, not to... We are living now in the seventh church age, we know that. If anyone don't believe we're living in the seventh church age, I'd have to say you haven't read your Bible or you don't have one. But in at God, we're in the seventh church age, and God's going to bring this bride to perfection. And in order to bring the bride into perfection, God would start somewhere in time, as we would take the account of Matthew chapter 25, where he would come and after displaying through a prophet all the miracles to draw a crowd of people in, then now God would bring his bride into a area and have the door closed but the door that's going to be closing, it's going to be closing to the foolish virgins. So as God's bringing things on ground in this hour, we're talking about perfecting the bride. The bride could not be perfected with what Jesus spoke on earth. It's part of it. The bride could not be perfected with just the doctrines of the apostles. Many churches in the world try to say that you're going to be ready for a rapture by just believing what Jesus said and the doctrines of the apostles. But in the hour that we live in, we understand that God brought a message. But in this message that God would bring, he would do things in three stages. The three stages of perfecting, to make things perfect, God would do this in three watches. And the first watch would you find in Matthew chapter 25. And as we, if you want to go there, Matthew chapter 25. I don't have to go through the whole parable of Matthew 25. You're all very familiar with Matthew 25. But I want to bring it down to verse 10. And while, speaking about the foolish now, while they went to buy, to buy the bridegroom came. Now, it's not to be confused with the bridegroom coming with the shout, with the, uh, the cry first. But when you arrive to verse 10, now it becomes, as it's spoken about here, he actually has come. Not physically, but he's come in a revelatory revelation to deal with a bride. Now as he would come to reveal a bride in what he's going to be doing from there on, from verse, from verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now the marriage, to prepare everything for the actual wedding, or to be married to Jesus Christ, would take from 1963 until the rapture. 
So that verse there, it's not just we can read it and, oh, it's just a few years. It spans from when God now starts to speak divinely to a people on the earth. But as the main separation, when the Lord got a prophet to speak about to reveal six seals, that put an end and cut off your denominational church. If you want to, yes, we look here in verse 10, the door was shut to the foolish virgins, but the door was also shut to the denominational church as well. So now we have a beginning, how God is starting to prepare this bride, and he's going to do it in three stages. It had to take a prophet to wake us Gentiles up. When the shout came, no, the world didn't hear an audible voice. But in the spirit application, it was really pronounced when that revelation of six seals was dropped here on the earth. So now God has started with bringing his bride in. But as he brings his bride in, now we have moved into Luke chapter 12, because you go from Matthew 25, 11, to Luke chapter 12, verse 36 to 38. He says, when he came, it doesn't say in Matthew what he's doing. But remember, we're looking at the same event of time. And so in Luke, the 12th chapter, Starting with verse 36, and ye likewise, and ye yourself like, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return. Now this return here is the same return as in Matthew 25, verse 11. But watch what he's doing. The return from the wedding or the wedding preparation, if you want to. That's what it really implies here. And when he cometh and knocketh, that you may open unto him immediately. Why does it have to be open immediately? Because it's giving that expression and it's giving us a little hint. The child of God, when he hears a fresh revelation, it's immediate. He sees it. It don't take him years and years to try to understand what it is. Now, if that child of God has never heard it, and he hears it later on, that's different. That's, but when it comes in the hearing of his, er, his ears, he's going, to be, he's going to respond immediately. How many of you, when you heard a fresh revelation, well, I don't know, I've got to study it now. So, so can you tell me if it's, if it's what it really means? That's intellect. Because... When a revelation comes in, when the carcass, when the eagle feeds his, when he feeds a little eagle here on the earth, when you hear something, it strikes your heart. You, you, you can't help but respond. You cry back, praise the Lord. It brings joy in your heart. It brings you alive. It makes you vibrant. So now... It says here, and when he cometh, and he said, and I'll verily I say to you, he shall gird himself. In other words, he bound himself with what? Divine, revelatory truth. Because watch what he's doing. He gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come and serve them. Now, as he's come, down to serve this meat. It goes hand in hand with Matthew 25 and verse 11, where he has come down. There it tells you he, he's come down. We go in the room, the door shut. It seems like it's done in a, in a blink of an eye. But it's taken the whole generation is what it's going to take. At the same time, we have to understand what our foolish virgins are. How can you tell a foolish virgin? Not we want to use that to 
label a person, but to identify the characteristic of a foolish virgin. A foolish virgin seeks the oil and the blessing and the anointing because that's where they were seeking the oil for joy, dancing in the spirit, speaking in tongues, having a glorious time. But a foolish virgin, that's his main concern. He will not come to a bride and argue with you. He stays away from argument. I want to go where the Holy Ghost meeting in his mind is, where the anointing is falling. So that's a foolish virgin. So God, as we are in that first watch, the denominational tares are being bundled. They're outside the picture. They're not in they're coming in that door. Your foolish virgin are not coming in that door because the words that's coming on ground requires those foolish virgins not just to look for the anointing, but to straighten up their life. Because if it did, then that would make them ready as time would go on. And to be made ready for the rapture is going to take all those three watches in order for us to be ready. Now we have moved into that first watch. But following the bride is your tares. The tares are not all in the bundle. The tares are following the bride as she's coming into these watches. And that's what's going on in the second watch and even in this third watch. God's bringing more of his word. And as you go from one watch to the other watch, there's an elim elimination of certain tears as you go through. Now, I was listening to Brother Branham. His messages in the last year before he passed away, he was preached. I never caught it till the hour that we're living in now. It sound. I mean, you can hear and you can have certain thoughts. That's one thing. But he was stressing the point. There are true believers, and there are intellectual believers. And he says those intellectual believers are not part of the bride. And he's giving in his, the different sermons. I listened to four or five of them in the last little while. And he's really stressing the point, not for you and I to go label someone, but to know what's going on amongst our midst. It's just like the parable of the wheat and the tear. Well, what Jesus said, the reason the, the wheat and the tear would grow till the end time it's so that the believers down through the eight, through the, these last 100 years would not be discouraged if you, if you see some tares believing almost like you do. Yes, there are true believers and there are tares. But now we are moving into no longer it's to the world in the sense of like the denominational having the word of God and going forth. But now God is bringing us into a place where he's feeding the carcass where that eagle spirit, and what is that eagle spirit? It's a cherubim. It is. And that cherubim is going to speak. And that cherubim is not just going to speak in that first watch under Brother Branham or under Brother Jackson, but he's also going to speak in this hour. That eagle didn't go park himself on a branch now that Brother Jackson's gone. Those that would try to tell you that are your intellectual believers. Now, as we are moving through time, as Brother Brown was trying to, to get the people in his day and his hour, if trying to catch the difference between a true believer and a make-believer or an intellectual believer. Now, why do I call him an intellectual believer? How many knows that a tear knows as much as you do? If he didn't, he wouldn't hang around any time near you. 
And God allows it to be that way for us testing us, but at that same time, he's going to test those intellectual or the, the terror believer. Now to begin with, How does a tear get get involved around the body of Christ? He's not a turnip that doesn't know anything. Actually, he might even be smarter than you are. But there's one trait that he can't that identifies him in time. While the bride and the intellectual believer depending on, on which watch you want to, or you can even bring this even in Martin Luther's day or in Wesley's day or in the, from, the, from Trinity to Oneness Pentecost. He's there growing when you're growing, but he's receiving it from an intellectual point of view because he's just come into something and Satan has allowed him to, to, under, to capture with his mind, what you're hearing. And he's allowed to grow while he's under tutorship. But when his tutorship is over, and the child of God's tutorship is over, then there comes a time that you have to walk forward. Because while you're under tutorship, you're listening to a servant. God has a servant somewhere. And while I'm on that subject, there's the idea today that while we're trying to get together, God's going to bring this fivefold ministry together. Not by committees and not by clans. It'll be like your messenger that you believe in, in what Brother Jackson said, it'll be through the voice of one man speaking one thing and everybody gets in line with the revelation of the hour. What did he do right from day one from Genesis with Moses, Elijah, Elisha? I can name them all. God had one man to speak, and God, it was God's chosen man that he would use to speak. And did the majority accept him? No, because those that were refused the one that's on ground, they were raised up in what was before, not what was before them. Even Jesus, when he approached the Pharisees, had they known who he was standing before them, all they could see is the past where they grew up in, Moses, the law, and so forth. Well, that's no different than this hour. It's the same as those that were in Brother Branham's camp. As they grew up in it, they accepted that, Oh, Brother Branham, Brother Branham. But then when God moved on, they have no foresight to move forward. All they can go is look backwards, and then, well, it's, it, it, we can dig something up that's from that message, and that's how the thing is going to unfold, and God's going to perfect it for there. That is Satan's method to keep, if you want to, those that are not going to be moving on they just stay where they grew up in from. Now, as the, the intellectual believer and the true believer are under tutorship, they're hearing the same thing. They may be talking to one another and seeing eye to eye in that manner. But then when God removes that servant, and moves to another one. Because what really makes the difference is the Holy Ghost. If you're born again, he'll show you things to come. He won't revert you. I'm going to look into things of the past all the time. You get it? So now that he's ready to move on, God has moved on. Whatever comes anew, he rebels. 
Now, he doesn't go with fist fighting, but you'll hear things. There are other voices. He's off. It's not a real true revelation. We have to wait. These are intellectual believers that will say that that identifies them. Because if they had the Holy Ghost in there, as they move from one servant or one watch to the next, they, would, they should be able to see the same, the same spirit that revealed it there should, is revealing it now in the next following watch. And the one that has the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost shows that believer now, now that he's no longer in tutorship, that Holy Ghost believer sees the truth and he strikes his heart and he sees it. While the intellectual, he'll make negative comments. Innuendos, negative views. Now when you look at the basic of the whole thing, what would have been someone that come from the Let's look at it in Brother Brown's day. If someone was hearing his message and saying, well, we like the miracles, but he's off now. He went off the word. God sees it. You can speak against the prophet if you like, but the danger is not speaking against the man. But if you're speaking what God is saying, God is going to cut you off. And he's not going to wait 10 years for you to come in line with the revelation that he's having on ground. He's not going to wait till if you came in as while well, Brother Brown was starting revealing the, the seals and so forth and moving on. God's not going to wait till he's off the scene for you, for you after three and a half years, then you might get it. No, because when it says here, immediately, when a revelation strikes you, it's immediately. If it don't strike you immediately, either we don't have the background to understand what was said, or it's an intellectual believer. He don't want to see it. And he relies only on the past. Well, Brother Jackson said, Brother Branham said, well, our church assembly, the oneness says, or the Trinitarian says, or the Baptist says, all those moves that has come up to that hour Everyone is exactly the same. Those that grew up in it, as God would want to move on, they can only, only look back at their forefathers because there's no revelatory Holy Ghost in them for them to move any further. That's the hour we're living in. And I know it may be hard and it may be harsh, but let's look at reality. And then we try to hide in this hour there's a five-fold ministry. Jesus is the prophet. Yes, I know. He's the one that's leading. Yes, I know. But is he going to use the five as being leading this and bringing the bride together? No. If you believe your apostle, he said there will be a man somewhere that God's going to use. It's just like when Korah and them, Moses I chose to speak to, but I didn't choose you. And the choosing of the man that God uses, God's choice, and we best see it, otherwise we're going to be cut off. This is the hour, because we're nearing now the time of that miraculous time to come. And tares are not going to be following us till the very end when the seventh seal is broke. It's to begin with. So what's happening? Why did, in Luke chapter 12, as he's feeding the servants, as we're in that 12th chapter of Luke, he bade them sit down to meet. And every true believer needs to know their place, and every servant needs to know their place as well. And as he's serving them meat, 
And he says to them, If it shall be, if, if he shall come in the second watch, or a third watch. Why the different watches? Lord, we're just waiting for, watching for you to come. Those watches has very much to do with the three stages of how God is bringing this bride to perfection and eliminating your intellectual tears. And if you want to know who they are, I can name some. But it's best that you find for yourself. If you see negative, rebelling against God's word for this hour, you can put a name on them. That's an intellectual believer. This, what God has been bringing on ground for the last while, has been on ground long enough. And if the, not that I don't want to put anyone simple, but the average believer picks it up and sees it, why cannot a ministry? And some ministries are, care, are scared to associate with what God's doing on ground now. You'll never find them touching anything here. When we talk about when Jesus talked about to his disciples, it's not for you to know the day or the hour, but the time and the season is not for you to know. That didn't mean nobody would ever know. But when time came along, as centuries went through, centuries and centuries, up to this century here, and in 1948, when Israel became a nation in one day, you don't have to be a rocket science to find out there ain't going to be another hundred years. Period. What is a generation? 200 years? No. So when Jesus, when Israel became a nation, you can put a date on it. That's history. Oh, but. And when they get fidgety like that, they'll turn back and look at something in Brother Jackson's message or in Brother Brown's message. Never looking forward because the Holy Ghost, I would question whether the Holy Ghost is there. It would be the same as those in the Branham camp or Pentecostal camp, if you want to. They're sitting in that as listening to the prophet. Then God brings a man that they didn't like. He's the black bird. He's the this and that and the other thing. Do they have the Holy Ghost? No. Well, that, that eliminates a lot of people. Well, what about the denominational world? The Catholic Church professed to have 1.2 billion believers. The same thing as the Catholic Church. They go back to their history, never going anything forward. They won't won't want to venture to going anything forward. If it's not their ministry, whether it's that or in the Pentecostal, whatever move you're in, if it's not your ministry and you start touching things of the future and it's not your calling, it's going to fall to the ground and you're going to eat humble pie. But if it's God's man, it'll stand the test. It'll run through. That's the hour. That you and I are living in. You find the example of intellectual believers all through. Brother Ray talked about Abel and Cain. As they were growing up with their parents, they knew what the sacrifice was supposed to be. I mean, if just following it would have been sufficient, God would have honored it. But the intellectual tear wants to beautify his altar. That was Cain. And so God was distraught with him. 
And over the course of time, he rebels. He can't get at God, but he's going to go after one of God's children, Abel. He kills him. Was that out of love? And someone that speaks bad about the truth in this hour, is that love? Now we have Cain. What about the days of Moses? And uh, this afternoon we had watched the movie The Ten Commandments. Korah, when they went into the wilderness. Moses, you take too much of yourself. We can run things just as much as you can. We think it ought to be this way. We ought to go back to where we have some things we came from. Go back to Egypt and eat some of the things we had there. We'd be better off. We're the, going forward is not, it's not, it's not the plan. That's, I'm just putting, reading between the line what Korah would, would be trying to project. But God, what did he do to Korah? He cut them off. God, God was Moses, Moses was God's spokesman, not Korah. You have also other examples like Jeremiah the prophet and Hannah, Hannah that prophesy about concerning in the time. Jeremiah says, Israel will be 70 years in Babylon. Hananiah comes along and says, no, 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 it's going to be two years. He had a different revelation. And he even mocked Jeremiah. That's the sign of an intellectual tear. He can only give innuendos, rebel. Now, rebel doesn't mean, oh, I hate you and all that. We don't want to have nothing to do with you. They don't say it openly, but that's what actually takes place. You think Brother Jackson could have went preaching anywhere in the Branham camp? They ostracize him. Why? I mean, they listened to a prophet. They had the word of the hour when they were growing up. Well, what caused them not to move any further? It's because they don't have the Holy Ghost. If whoever has the Holy Spirit, you're born again, he's going to show you things to come when he moves on. And the Lord has moved on since 2005. And those that would just want to hide in two th prior to 2005 and in Brother Branham's message and finding things there that, that the bride will somehow mystically will all come together, that don't fit the pattern. Now in this hour, there's going to be maybe more than one because it'll be through the apostolic ministry, not through a pastor or evangelist or a teacher. God's going to use apostles that will have a fresh word, not a has been long time ago or not too far ago word, because the Lord is still moving on. Otherwise, why have a fivefold ministry? It's all in the message. Isn't that what the Branham people say? Well, that seven seals is in the message. We just got to look at it and dig it out, and we find some nuggets here. And, and, and we're fine. That's good. And they, they get the people excited. Oh, we got this here. And they bring it from a certain avenue. That's the same thing as the denominational world does. They'll get some energetic preacher. They'll come in to excite the people. Wow. God's moving. And because there may be a lot of display, God's moving. He's not moving. You have revelatorily wise, you have not moved nowhere. But God's going to move his bride forward. Maybe I should bring it back. And the movement today don't like to hear this part. They'll try to turn it, twist it around. Well, Jesus is, gonna, is leading. Well, yes, he is. He's always been leading ever since he went, went up on high. I mean, what part don't you understand about that part? It's his spirit. 
So this was from a contender, Unity and Leadership. It's uh, in 2004. If you want to listen to the MP3, The Body of Christ, and there's a contender. Not that I'm, what, I'm relying on that, but what he said, if we believe what God had instructed him to say, and when he said that, he was pretty adamant. He says, God will not start with a group of men. That's a warning to the ministry in this hour. He will start with the voice of one man that will lift up the word strong enough, loud enough. Well, could you, maybe could you see? No. Because it has to be loud enough that those men will know that it is God is in it. And then when you follow this all through the book of Acts, as, as be said as a type, you want to, you will see how it worked in that hour. Peter, James, uh, sorry, Peter and John were on their way to the temple, and when they passed by a crippled man that laid there, he had been laying there many other times as Jesus went through, no doubt, but Jesus did not touch him. Oh, and I'd like to put that to those that say, just believe in heal, heal anybody at any time. Just pray and they, they'll be healed as long as you've got, you, if you can lift yourself by faith. If God don't speak to you in one form or another that someone's going to be healed, you're only going on an assumption, not on a revelation. A revelation means God has given you something, but then if he's given you something, you better act upon it. He looked to Jesus for help, but didn't get it. On this particular morning, uh, sorry, on this particular morning, the word of God made him whole. From then on, you begin to see other men come into the picture. Because as Jesus is off the scene, now you have Peter, you have James, and you have John. All these men are coming on the scene. That is what I'm saying this morning. If there's ever going to be unity, if you are concerned about unity, look at the examples all down through how God used to bring forth his word. If there's ever going to be unity among true bride saints, there has to be the voice of one man. Jesus is not going to speak divinely and, and have a loudspeaker for everybody to hear. He's going to use a vessel to speak something who all other men will get in line with. <coughs> I realize that sounds odd to some people because he was seeing it in his day. Some were looking, thought they would, that the unity would come another way. He says, I realize that sounds odd to some people because they have thought, well, that is not the way I thought it was going to be. It's not the person or the way that, God, that I thought God was going to do this. In other words, it is not what you want it to be. And if you keep going down that road, as sure as I'm standing here, God's going to cut you off. Yes, you'll still have the intellect of all the things you've learned and the things you can dig into the previous message of Brother Jackson and Brother Branham, but you can't see your day. That it is not what you want it to be. But this is according to the New Testament pattern as seen in the ministry of the apostles of Christ in the first age. Brothers and sisters, There is a rejection of a good part of the ministries. Maybe they have not heard, but I'm sure most of them have. This revelation of concerning the centuries is over. Not accept it. The judgment seat of Christ. He's going to be judging the dead up in glory, and the angel is judging them down here of the living element. They don't even accept that there's three watches. 
You won't hear it from their mouth. Why? They don't believe it. They'll speak against it. You can speak against the servant as much as you like. But this be God's word, then God's cutting you off. And the reason you have to rally up the troops is because you have no fresh meat. Oh, we got meat, got the things Brother Brown bought and brother thing Brother Jackson brought. What did your apostle say about fresh meat? It's not something 10 days old or 20 years old. It's something, right, fresh. It goes along with what we've seen in Luke. He says that to open up to him immediately when he brings a revelation on ground. I realize the hour that we're living in. There's two ways the intellectual believer is going to go. As now he's moved off or under the servant that God used him, used under, and now he's moving into that third watch. He'll either go wild in some wild revelations, or he can only stay in the past, cannot see his day. That's thus saith the Lord. Now it's getting serious. The third day revelation. You can shoot holes through that. The lake of fire is in the center of the earth. You can shoot holes through that. Because you can take the scripture and show that it's wrong. But I'm saying this evening. If you believe what we're preaching here is wrong, pick this up, use this, and shoot it to pieces. The time for playing church is over. Because if we keep going on like this and hoping something's going to happen here and there, and is it coming together? No, it's not. And the only way we can come together is on fresh, divine meat. That's why in Luke, the 19th chapter, There too, Luke the 19th chapter is also in this time frame of the three watches. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive to himself a kingdom and to return. When? Here at the end time. In a message. In serving meat. In the carcass. All these things. And he called... Ten servants. Now the reason Jesus says ten servants is to show that this parable does not belong in the early church. It belongs here at the end time. Ten, it's in the time frame that there would be five wise and five foolish. It's here at the end time. It's not bringing you back to the 1900s. It has to start from there, but in that time frame that these would be on earth. That's when... He's giving that indication to show when this parable is starting. Then he says to them, and these ten, and he delivered to them ten pounds and says, Occupy till I come. Now the ten pounds were not just delivered in 1963 or in 1967 to 2005. It's an ongoing delivery of these pounds. And along with what I'm saying this evening, the following verse identifies your intellectual ones. But his citizens. Where are these citizens? They're the same one that sat in the assemblies that was hearing the same word as you are. The citizens of that kingdom of God. They're not born again, but they're listening at the same time. That's where the citizens are. They're not citizens of Jew of Jerusalem. We're looking at here in the end time in these last three watches. And his servants, sorry, but his citizens 
hated him. Why? They have a different spirit. They have a rebellious spirit. And the citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Those are words that's not going to be said here on earth, but the expression that takes place on the earth, they will not have that revelation you're teaching to be over us. And they hate it. They rebel. Oh, but I'm preaching love. We're, we're, we're walking closer to Jesus. So does the denominational the church. That's what they preach too. But even though there's nothing wrong with preaching love, but if you're forsaking and speaking against of the pound that's being delivered, if you read the end of this parable, it doesn't bode well for those that speaks against God's truth. Or give little innuendos, well, you know, it, it's, it's uh, somebody's trying to make something of himself, or, or, or there's voices out there. When they say there's voices out there, they're not concerned. There's always been voices. They never spoke about it in those other watches. They're speaking about the voice that's here. That's the voice that they're speaking against. And I don't care who it hurts. Somebody has to tell the truth somewhere, somehow, some way. And so, they will said that they'd not have this man to reign over us. It's by their attitude saying, we don't believe Jesus, your word, for the, uh, for the servant using it this hour. So we're not going to have that to be over us. That's why the Pharisees, when Jesus approached them, they couldn't accept him. They couldn't see what's standing before them. They had no eyes to see. Yet, simple fishermen, Peter, James, and the different apostles, and the, the, the crowd that came to listen to Jesus, listened to him gladly, yet they didn't have the Holy Ghost. But these professors, educated, I know the message, I know what Moses taught, I know what the prophet taught, I know what Brother Jackson taught. Sure you do. But you can't see your day. Skirting around what God is bringing forth on ground is only going to be to your decrement. No, not God's not going to banish a whole assembly here and there. Did he do it with the denominational church? He just let them go their way. If we're living through the time, nearing perfection, God works in threes. The first watch, that's to perfect this bride to completion. And we will need the fivefold ministry, but not all the fivefold is going to get together and they're going to have a revelation or they have to pass by the fivefold to find out what is the truth. He didn't ask the, the people in the, in the wilderness, Moses, Let's, we're going to take a vote and see if you are saying things right or not. Or Elijah. Or even Jesus. The Pharisees didn't say, well, we're going to make a, go get together and get a vote on this and we'll see if what you're saying is right. That's why in that parable he says that to open up to him immediately. Whatever hour that truth, whatever you're sitting in, whenever that came, that revelation comes to you immediately. And the comforter that's sent to you and I, that is to show us some of these things to come, he says, well, I just hope they get their things in order. I've mean, been trying to tell them now for 10 years uh, what the truth is, what I'm trying to show them. That's the hour that we live in. We're living in that last generation.
In 1 Samuel chapter 12, I was just going to quote a scripture or two, you know, and bring it to a close. In Samuel chapter 12, 1, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6, And Samuel said unto the people, The Lord is witness, who gave authority to Moses and Aaron, and who took your fathers out of the land of Egypt. In the, uh, in the 14th verse, he says, If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. The trouble is, the intellectual believer, he doesn't see it at at God's word coming on ground. So he's rebelling against something he don't realize, but because he don't have that comforter to show him things to come. Now granted, it was not that in in the Old Testament. It says, and if you will fear the Lord, serve him, and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and the, also the king that reigns over you continue following the Lord your God. Now the 15th verse, but if you obey not the voice of the Lord, but rebel against his commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. Harden not your hearts in the day of provocation. He's looking from what they did, yes, in the Old Testament. But this is now in the New Testament. Why would someone harden their heart? Because what God brings on ground rubs them the wrong way. It's not what I thought the revelation should be. And it's not the way that I thought that how it should go. Well, if you don't know how it should go, then why meddle in God's affair? Well, to begin with, when God did use he brought forth Brother Jackson on the scene. He tried to go to different places where the Branham people, and all they wanted to hear things of the past. They didn't want to hear nothing of the future. Nothing. They said, we don't want to hear what you have to say. Tell us what Brother Branham said. Well, if I'd have been there, I said, well, hey, don't you have the book? Read them or listen to the tape. I mean, you can do that anytime. But you want to hear what God's doing today. They didn't want to hear. So everywhere he went, the road was cl- closed off. It got to the point he was so discouraged he's about to quit. Then there came a prophecy: if you start, if you don't stop going west and going east, your ministry is over. Now that's a stark warning. <laughs> You're having it bad enough; they're not accepting you, and then the God gives you something like that. It says go east, and then there's another message that came forth: go to Moncton and start a church. And put someone in charge. Well, it's not the question of put someone in charge. Why did God want him to go to Moncton to start? Because God knew when he would bring his apostle off the scene that Moncton would be now a source of light for the bride. Because what I see among the movement now, none except for one. If I name him, then people will... You're sighing with, with someone. If you have the Holy Ghost, you know who I'm talking about. God's shown him things. And it's not just things of the past, things of today. They may not, depending on, on what God's using him for, yes, there's going to be one, more than one apostle. But nevertheless, that's the hour that we're living in. I don't know what else to do. How, how can you shake people? You can't. Can you force them to believe? No. But I'm giving this as a warning. Listen to what your apostle said if you don't believe what we're saying being here. Because pray if you're praying for something, pray that God will raise up a man that will have a voice. And it won't be just digging things from the past from the apostles' ministry and the prophets' ministry and all these other things. 
Those things are good. No, no, I'm not knocking at that at all. We need that. That's part we grew up in. But if that's all we're staying, you will never, never be perfected. Actually, as the parable talks about in Luke chapter 12, your house is going to be broken because you did not want to watch. Not how to prepare your soul, he's talking about. He's talking about his coming. And there would be revelations upon revelation that God has dropped in this hour that was not dealt with in 2005 and beyond, and backwards, that God has dealt in this hour. And, you will, and when the time comes that that seventh seal is actually broke, and prior to that seventh seal being actually broke, there's something else. I want. Oh, yeah. If you've got a few more minutes. Okay. In Matthew chapter 25, when he talks about the foolish virgins, later on at the end, during this third watch somewhere, there's foolish virgin going to asking, say, Lord, open up to us. It's not those words that were spoken, but they know there's something missing because of the hour and what's on ground is really pricking to the heart that they're missing something. So they want to open, Lord, open up to us. And the Spirit would want to direct them to the bride, but if the message is too far removed from them, they can't bridge the gap. But now let's look to Luke again in the 13th chapter. Verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but they shall not be able to. Why? They're blinded. Once, when, once the master of the house is risen up and shut the door, what door is he shutting to? It's not to the foolish version. That's way back here in 1967, leading up to 1967, from, from the late 50, 50, 57 to 63, where if you're in that space of time, that's where the foolish version, where the door was shut to them. They were looking for anointing and meetings, so therefore they didn't go where the word was. But this scripture here, when we're reading this, once the master of the house is risen up, he has come down and served me all through these three watches. But here, when the watch is ending, and has risen up and shut the door, he's not shutting the door to the foolish. He's not shutting the door to the denominational church. The only thing that you can, that's left that you're going to shut the door to is your intellectual tears. Believers. And ye begin to stand without and to knock, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Well, that sounds like the same thing that says concerning the foolish virgin, which actually takes place over in this period of time. But now you are over here in this period of time, because watch. And he shall answer and say unto thee, I know you not from whence you are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence. They were citizens where the pounds were being delivered. They're not having street meetings. It's just a point of view reference showing what's happening on ground. And then they shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence. Why? Because as the Lord's presence would deliver pounds, revelation, they were sitting there but rejecting. I have drunken in thy presence and has taught in thy street. Now watch what he says. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from whence you are. Ye are, ye, ye are, sorry. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Your foolish virgins are not workers of iniquity. 
It's, he's not pointing to the denominational theory. That's been dealt with before the three watches ever started. But he's pointing to when he's about closing the door to this third watch. There's some who's going to say, hey, now it open up to us because things on ground will point to them, hey, maybe we shouldn't have just hid ourselves in the past. And now it comes to reality. Now they're looking. That's those that are going to have their house broken. And he says here, But ye shall say, I know you not from what you are, you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They had an opportunity because they were in the same street that the bride was at, hearing the same message. Yes, those that have maybe in the first watch that has died on, that's not going to be said to them. They'll know the reality when they die. But it's talking about a living element that's going to be, it, you're not going to say from hell, oh Lord, open up to us. It's too late, right? So it can't be in the beginning of those three watches. It has to be at the ending of this third watch because they're saying it from an earthly point of view, Lord, open up to us. Give us an opportunity to hear truth. You don't get that opportunity in hell. So it's talking about a living element at the very end, in this point of time here somewhere, when the Lord decides to raise up because he's bringing things to a close now, and he's telling them, I don't know you. You are workers of iniquity. You are not the foolish virgins because he doesn't tell them the foolish virgins are workers of iniquity. They are virgins. They will have eternal life, but they weren't made ready. So this element that's here is dealing with the tears that has followed the bride, that plagued the bride all through those three watches. But when we're talking here, it's looking at the final spot that those, there would be an element on ground that represents what the others probably have done. They're now saying, Lord, open up to us. What's going to cause this? Oh, my goodness. Maybe I should split it off in two messages. When the miraculous move comes on ground, God is only going to be anointing those that recognize divine revelatory truth for their hour. And the others will not. And so when they see God moving in that, then it's too, it's too late because... Just as the Brenner movement cannot bridge the gap to Brother Jackson's message, neither can those in Brother Jackson's message bridge the gap to when the bride comes to her completion here at the end of this third watch. That's how serious it is. Ah, uh, he's just sounding off again. All I'm saying, look into it. If you feel what's being preached here is Error. Use this and not saying, well, it's another voice. You have, you're acting when you're doing that, you're acting like a tear. Because a tear has no knowledge of things that God's bringing on ground, so that's all he can do. He's rebel and say, well, it's not that. Uh, he's, what, he's doing, he wants to make something of himself. If I wanted to make something of myself, I would go on the TV and a satellite. And first of all, even if you did, you ain't going to go nowhere unless God's in it. The bride is a small element here at the end. Somebody has to say something, fresh meat. And you hear comment. Well, they have a revelation every day. Yes, but you don't have none. No fresh one. All you can point is the back. Well, you, you're, you're not showing love. If I didn't care, I would say, hey, believe what you're like. Maybe it's all going to come together. You do your own thing. It's going to be great. The Lord is going to work it all out, and he's going to bring everything together. It has to be according to his word.
And like I said, those that would have the Holy Ghost, if you're listening to other sermons, if you hear you innuendos about truth without ever actually using this to, to show that it's error, now we can show that the, seventh, that the uh, third day is false. It's not because I say, well, the third day is false. I can use the scripture. And that's the only way that things would get settled. I wish to God, use somebody else. Because it's not an easy position to be in. But I don't care if I have to be the only one. I'm going to stick with the word. Well, you say, every preacher says that. Yes, they, they do. Uh, we have the word of God. We are walking in the truth. We have the light for the hour. They're blinded. They can only... See, in their little surrounding or the revelation they came into. And the, the trouble is, as God moves on, because if we walk in the light as he is in light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If I stop to walk, then there's things that are not going to be cleansed because he's moved on over here. And if God has moved on, then as that light gently moves away from you, darkness starts to creep in. No, you don't lose your revelation, but you just stay in the past. You'll never move forward. No more than the, than the, the Pentecostal can move forward. No more than the Brandon move can move forward. This ain't going to make a lot of friends, but I'm not here to make friends. I believe in looking at the truth for this hour. Well, I'll save some for next time. Next time. Uh, I said that we're going to preach a love message one of the days. I will. But if we love him, do we love just the Jesus of the past? In the days of the apostles, Martin Luther, Wesley, the, the oil message, Brother Branham, Brother Jackson. What about today? His servants will be where he is at. We're not up in glory, it's where he is at in revelatory time. And if I'm staying back in the days of Pentecost, I'm out of time with what the, where the Lord is at. The Lord is now has moved in to this third watch. Whether people believe it or not, that doesn't make any difference to me. But I know that I know that I know that we are in that third watch. Because if Jesus was only saying one watch, he would not have never said there's going to be a second one and a third one. Why three? God works in threes. When he brought that little bride into the room, it would be through three stages, through a prophet, through a, an apostle, and a fivefold ministry, then the bride will be perfected. Ephesians chapter 4 will come into full fulfillment. And it will be God's choosing whom he wants to use. It'd be, wouldn't it be nice if we made a vote just like our government and we'll vote whoever it's going to be? Do you think that will work? Or, or if, we bunch of, if I get along with some bunch of brothers and saying, well, we're the message now. We're, we, we know what it is because we're all believing alike. Believing alike doesn't buy you anything. Do all the Trinity Pentecostal believe alike? Pretty well. Do the oneness all believe alike? Pretty well. Do all those in Brother Branham believe the same? Pretty well. So there's no security in that. The only security is in this word. Oh, I better, I'm getting bad. Maybe this eyesight. Yes, it's, you just have to be more careful in the bright sunlight. But uh, the Lord knows about that too. But are you still happy? Yes. Would you rather me to preach your crackers and crumbs? If I wanted that, I'd go on the internet and listen to these uh, preachers that are on there. They'll maybe say something. It can, they can say something to help you. That's not the problem. 
if I'm doing something wrong or, or not living right. And they, they can, there is still some good things, but the message is not there. Just because someone preaches the gospel and the, the doctrines of the apostles doesn't mean God, is, God can use some of that to bring somebody along. And I'm rambling on, I realize. Okay, let's just stand. Heavenly Father, I realize it was a bit long this evening, Lord. And Lord, I'm not bringing this, Lord, to hurt anyone, but Lord, it's what you want for this hour. And Lord, it's best that to obey you than to obey men. Lord, use it as you would see fit as it would go forth. I know, Lord, there's still things to come. There's yet that eagle is still screaming. The carcass, there's still some fresh meat to come. We, Lord, we can't make it come when we want, but Lord, in your good time, as you would drop it in, you will use a voice to speak it out, and Lord, the eaglets will see it. I thank you, Lord, for the hour that I live in, and give you the praise and the honor in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, I pray tonight. Amen. Okay, Paul, uh, I know I've been long and...